continuing coverage from the Molten Salt Reactor Conference at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. I'm sitting here with Ed File and Carl Perez, and you're both with Elysium Industries. Can you tell the listeners about your machine? Our reactor is a molten chloride salt fast reactor, so the fuel is liquid salt, basically table salt with uranium and plutonium mixed in with it. The fast spectrum allows us to use uranium and plutonium waste from spent nuclear fuel and plutonium to be consumed in the reactor to convert it to power and get rid of them. Take table salt, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and we dissolve uranium chloride in it and plutonium chloride and operate the reactor. The reactor is just an empty can with fuel that can go critical so there's no internal core structures Mm -hmm. uh, that are damaged. The fuel repairs itself faster than it's damaged so we don't have any uh, fuel damage so we don't have to replace fuel regularly. We actually replace the reactor vessel sooner than we replace the fuel. And we operate at very low pressure like liquid metal reactors so the vessels are low cost. We operate at very high temperatures like uh, high temperature gas reactors uh, but at low pressure so we can give the benefits of the high process heat that high temperature gas reactors can. So we basically have all the benefits of all the other reactor types in a reactor that also burns all the waste of other reactors. I know, Ed, you have uh, you came into the business uh, from an extensive career with the Navy where you did a lot of work with a lot of different reactors for per- ship propulsion, correct? Yes, I worked at the Naval Nuclear Labs at the Knowles Atomic Power Lab. And I started out there as a a Navy operator training Navy students to operate reactors. Uh, And then I had a career of 32 years uh, designing every kind of reactor you can imagine, and many of you can't, including a reactor that goes to Jupiter's moons. That essentially influenced the ability to figure out two things. Well, which is the most economic reactor that you can build for a commercial use but also what features of the other reactors can you design into the reactor that you choose. Carl, how did you get involved with Elysium Industries? The way we formed as a company, because Ed and I are co-founders of this company, is we set a set of parameters that we wanted to be able to have a design that met those parameters. And so for us it was safety, making sure that there is no radioactive material dispersal in the event of a catastrophe or in the event of an accident. And what I think is important to stress is there is no foolproof system. Systems fail, no matter what industry you're in. And it's very important to note that you can control what type of scenario is going to happen. And so we decided to choose a technology that made sure that if there was an accident, that there would be no radioactive material dispersal beyond the plant. And it wouldn't be getting into the water, and it wouldn't be affecting uh, our food source or, or water source. The second tenet of that was waste. Waste storage being viewed as one of the largest impediments for the nuclear industry's revival. Because we say, what are we going to do with all this waste? And so we wanted to figure out a way to be able to use it, if anything. The third parameter was weapons. We think about nuclear and constantly, consistently associated with weapons and, and proliferation. And so one of the parameters was, how do we design a reactor, a nuclear power plant, that is able to be built in Iran or North Korea for which we wouldn't be worrying about weapons being made out of it. And that meant that we had to have full fuel consumption and even better, the possibility of even uh, disposing and consuming uh, weapons-grade material. Our reactor doesn't have any weapons-grade material in it at any time. The fourth attribute that really reunites the three first that I mentioned is cost. Because engineering and safety, adding active safety systems, Um, looking at the waste problem, looking at uh, how to make the system uh, non-proliferative, those add costs. And and so if you take those parameters and flip it upside down, set them and say, okay, let's choose a design that addresses these issues, now you're looking at it differently, especially from a cost profile. And so it's not we developed a molten salt reactor design or we wanted to build a molten salt reactor and then added on these parameters. It was, this is what we need to do to revive the nuclear industry. In fact, my father was actually anti-nuclear, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and he was doing the riots against Super Phoenix in France. So it's funny how the molten salt reactor, for me at least, was a, a gateway of, wow, there are innovations in nuclear that can help stimmy um, its, its revival. We set the parameters that we set 
at the get-go of the business because we wanted to be able to anticipate the reality of the market. The market is not rational, it's irrational. It's full of human beings with perceptions, with, with concerns that are valid, that are valid, sometimes not well understood, but it's very important to be able to have a response for that. And so part of what we're doing with our technology is providing a response to those anti-nuclear uh, advocates because at the end of the day, if they can't use waste, if they can't use weapons, and if they can't use cost as an argument, then that's when you've actually shown that nuclear does have promise. And they, at the same time, feel like we've addressed their concerns. So they feel like they're a part of the conversation. So I do think it's very important to also accept those fears. Many times I found myself in arguments with, with individuals in the nuclear industry that would tell me waste is not a problem. Yes, I understand. From a technical perspective, it can be viewed as, as a non-problem because it doesn't take a whole lot of space. But it is viewed and considered a, a, a problem. It's a political problem. So it still is a problem. And, and, and that's why I think that at the contrary of, of many of the, of, the, of the individuals in our space, a lot of them try to debate on the facts. And I feel like we've, we've gotten into an era of, you know, we're, we're above the facts now. Now it's, it's really just opinions. And that's the reason why you have to develop a technology that addresses those. First up today is an Edward Feel? File. Members of the House Energy and Natural Resources Committee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. My name is Ed File. I am co-founder and chief technology officer of Elysium Industries USA. Elysium is a, an advanced reactor company seeking to develop and commercialize the Elysium molten chloride salt fast reactor, representing a cross-section between nuclear energy and high-level waste management sustainable, inexpensive, base load and process heat energy while consuming nuclear waste and providing options for nuclear services for irradiation testing, diagnostics, medical isotopes and treatments. We are turning the waste into about 30 times as much energy as the light water reactors themselves produced, doing it just for the spent nuclear fuel portion of it. And then you had the depleted uranium, which is another 10 times as much energy. But the high temperature could also be used for synthetic fuel production, hydrogen production and other types of process heat that will help reduce any CO2 levels, but more importantly, will help eliminate pollution. The negative perception of existing nuclear technology has abated investment and innovation and is mostly built on the fear of accidents such as Chernobyl and Fukushima. Fortunately, the United States developed a portfolio of advanced reactor solutions back in the 1960s and 70s. Elysium is one of the many vendors commercializing such designs. Could you describe the scalability of your reactor? Our reactor is the same size regardless of power level. It is just an empty cup that's filled with salt and it's barely critical. So we don't need extra um, fuel cells or fuel in the core to make a higher power or lower power. It is barely critical all the time, so it's the same reactor vessel. So for that reason, we put the heat exchangers on the outside of the vessel. So if you put a small heat exchanger and pump on the outside of the vessel, you can operate at a low power because the fuel efficiency isn't an issue because our fuel is extremely cheap. But then if you need to scale the power up, you add a larger heat exchanger, a 500 megawatt thermal, 200 megawatts electric heat exchanger set on there. And you can get up to six around the vessel for up to 1200 megawatts electric but scaling it up just by adding pumps and heat exchangers without changing the core at all. And is that something you think utilities will do? Add more heat exchangers on? If they're making electricity and they want to buy into the market cheaper to get started, um, then yes, that's probably what they'll do. They'll try to start off with lower power um, and build, build it up over time. But if you have other models, like if you want to do uh, something like synthetic fuel or consume spent nuclear fuel as your primary goal, then, you, then that only occurs in a large reactor because synthetic fuel, you're going to need a lot of energy. You're not going to want to start with a tiny amount of power. You need a lot of it. If you want to consume spent fuel, you need to fission stuff and you need a lot of power. The, the fissioning is proportional to the power, so you need a lot of power to do that. So you would build a big reactor from the start particular traction that we received on the scalability, especially from emerging economies that don't necessarily have the grid that can withstand or can, or can transport 1,200 megawatts out of, a, out of a nuclear power plant. And so they want to be able to grow uh, their demand as their grid capability can, can, can meet it. 
other reactors that are out there that are small modular reactors that allows you to scale the power up over time require you to buy a new reactor every time you scale up. Whereas in our case, the reactor is the same and you just add pumps and heat exchangers. So you don't have to add an entire new reactor system to scale up the power. So that's going to reduce costs at least up to the 1200 megawatt electric range. Especially from a licensing perspective. It's a very different licensing regime if you're setting, building up a new reactor and putting a new reactor in a facility than just adding heat exchangers or pumps. There will be a licensing process for that, for the upgrade, but much less onerous. Are you guys kind of unique in offering that? Is that just a notion you came up with or is something that's different about your reactor that enables it whereas other reactors, they don't do it because they can't do it? It's primarily about the molten chloride salt fast reactor. If you have a molten chloride salt fast reactor, open core structure, you can do this. All right, if you have a thermal MSR, then you're kind of limited by the fuel channels and the moderation as to how much power you can take out of each channel. All right, so it's, it's the specific reactor type that allows that. Now, it's only our concept that has done that. No one else has done that, at least not to date. It's not easy to increase heat transfer in the core. Our reactor is just a liquid core. The fission occurs and deposits it in the liquid with no heat transfer through a metal surface. When you start transferring heat through a heat exchanger and stuff, that limits the rate at which you can transfer heat and how much heat you can make. Liquid fuel allows for access to extract medical isotopes or placing irradiation or test cells anywhere in or around the core. The design is to maximize flexibility for many uses, including load following. Could you share with us the biggest hurdle for you to implement this technology and whether you see 104 as having a real impact? The Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission are having a difficulty developing the capabilities of regulating advanced nuclear plants and actually regulating in a timely manner. It takes a minimum of five and a half years to license a nuclear reactor in the United States but it takes about three years to license a gas plant. Yet nuclear plants don't kill anyone, but gas plants occasionally do. Some of the leading candidates on the Democratic side are pretty anti-nuclear. In an ideal scenario for me, oh, I believe in fusion, I believe in so many technologies out there. But why did we choose a molten salt reactor? Because it was already built. I was even pleasantly surprised with the reception when we shared more details on our technology. And the potential of it, in addressing a lot of the issues that are the reasons why they're anti-nuclear. No matter who becomes the president, when you see the bipartisanship that went behind NEMA, for example, where you had a vote, I think it was 370 to 10. When you're talking with Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, and, and those candidates that are very anti-nuclear, I think that's when you need to just show them the technology. We have the hope in front of us. And I think it's just about getting the message out because I definitely think that even the anti-nuclear candidates couldn't change their minds. If they're true to, to their values and what they're trying to achieve, I don't see why they wouldn't change their mind on, on nuclear. Call your representative. Because most of the times when we're discussing in DC, they have no clue what a molten salt reactor is. And I think it's very important to differentiate the molten salt reactor from traditional reactors. I think it gives a pass to anti-nuclear activists to be able to separate and say, I'm still right. Yes. Give, give, give them something and say, but then let's, let's agree on this. And I feel like that's, that's something that we haven't used enough as, as a tool, the nuclear industry. We could have solved climate change already. It could have been a, a, an issue of the past. Energy poverty could have been an issue of the past because it te these technologies were developed in the 60s. Individuals like you really make a difference. Because if it weren't for you, for example, Gordon, I would have never been able to see a, a video on a molten salt reactor. Funny enough, in one of your videos, you actually have like part of our founding team, as you just turned it, but they hadn't met each other yet. We can focus on the technology so you have something to talk about, but it really comes down to you to get that message out. Call your representative and say, look at molten salt reactors, a carbon-free source that works 24-7. You cannot ignore it. So just to conclude, if folks wanted to find out more about Elysium Industries, how would they be able to do that? ElysiumIndustries.com. All right. And Gordon? No. You know? <laughs> All right. And that's it. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. I mean, I assume, assume you're splicing it up. And this has been Energy News and Space Report on WOBC 91.5 FM, Oberlin College and Community Radio.